this morning. I thought I would just highlight for those of you that missed the conference just some of the things that we spoke about the presence. Dr. Pam opened up with Genesis 1, verse 26, when she talked about the image and the likeness of God. Man was created in that image and that likeness. And she did a description that I love my visual uh, of revelation of Genesis, God's appointment with man every single day, because God begins his day in the evening. From the evening to the morning is the first day. And you come to him in the cool of the evening. My visual is, is, is similar to uh, Dr. Pam's visual that she shared, is that they knew the timing of God and everything went quiet. The birds didn't sing. The fowls didn't clack. The fish that were still in the sea, the waters didn't, didn't cut, um, come gushing up to the sandbanks. The trees just stood still because God's presence came walking. The sound of him came walking. So you heard the sound before you had the presence. Everything was at rest and ease because they wanted to hear. Earth wanted to hear what God was saying to himself. I'm going to say it again till you hear me. Everything went silent because they wanted to hear what God was saying to himself. They knew God talked to himself in the heavens because he said, let, it, let us make man. So he had a conversation with somebody before he made man. But when he made, once he made man, earth got the opportunity. Every living thing got the opportunity to be still to hear what God was saying to man. Thank you. <laughs> Today I want to talk to you as I wrap up this conference. I want to challenge you in this statement to be a custodian of his presence. Patrina talked about and, and quite you talk about projecting the presence, what it is to project the presence. Two sessions were on preparing for the presence. I love what um, Pastor Keeman said, if you're just fasting without doing the things that go along with fasting, you're just on a diet. Because fasting requires worship. It requires the word. It requires prayer. But those that talked about the preparation for his presence. So they talk about preparation. They talk about presence. They talk about priority. They talk about position. They talk about participate. And most importantly, practice. The other one that talked about project, um, project the presence. I love this one because I'm, I'm getting into technology the, more I, the older I get, which is a challenge. <laughs> But it's a good challenge to have because you've got young people and they will teach you if you listen. And they talked about projecting the presence and, and they use the illustration of the projector. And one of the things I wrote down and I highlighted is that you have to have a certain sequence of order. If you skip the order, it's not going to project on the screen. There's a certain order that you've got to go through. And then I love the other phrase that they use, cause and effect. If I get in his presence, I'm going to have the effect of his presence. How do, your, how do your leaders know that you have been preparing six days of the week before you get here on Sunday? Because there is a cause and effect. Some of us can linger longer in his presence because the cause is we've been doing it throughout the week. The effect is we just made it public. Oh, I'm going to I'm 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 just I'm gonna keep, keep moving on, Dr. Marina. They haven't given me any, oh, they, now they've given me time. All right, good. They gave you 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. Now I look in a mirror. I love that. I love that because it shows you the progression of time. Once I was a child, I thought as a child, I acted as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I'm talking to you about being a, a custodian. What is a custodian? Let me tell you what it is. It is a person responsible for something. Those of you that are technical, you know that um, 
I'm jumping ahead of myself. What is a conduit? When I think of a custodian, I, I think also of a conduit. It's a channel for conveying water or other fluid. Um, it can be a tube or a trough for protecting electrical wiring. That's all the technical stuff, right? But I love this part. This, this particular definition is what I want to challenge you with. Being a custodian and a tie with a conduit, you are a person or an organization that acts as a channel for transmission of something. I'm gonna to say to you, you are a person, if you're in an organization, where, where am I at? I'm at Praise Christian Worship Center, Houston. Wherever you are, you are a person or you might be the head of an organization, but you are to act as a channel for transmission of something. When you know his presence, I, I had this phrase that I once said, to bring the sound of heaven, you've had to go to heaven first. There are people that sing about an open heaven, and it's just a nice song. But there are people that sing about an open heaven, and you feel like heaven just went whoosh. <laughs> Those of you that were here this weekend, you totally understand that. When heaven descends, you've got to have been there to know how to respond to it. I love giving this illustration. I, I don't get tired of giving it. When a child is born, fresh out of the womb, and the father is there, the father just says a word, maybe it's a, ah, and that child turns its head to find that voice. Because it was hearing that voice in the womb. So when it hears it now outside, it knows immediately. The mother doesn't have to say, honey, babe, They've named it already. Dad is that way. Once he hears that voice, it automatically, it's innate. They've automatically become a custodian to hear and know the voice and respond to the voice. We're talking about his presence. Some people will, will read you scriptures. They will give you definition. But can you create it? You talk about it, but can you create it? You know, sometimes, unlike old school um, worship, sometimes I go for the hymns, and many will say, oh, you're in that mode. <laughs> sometimes I go for the new stuff, and he goes, I don't like the new stuff. He says, it's, it's, it's like melancholy, it's like, the, it's like depression. And I said, we're gonna get a lot of that, because a lot of people were depressed last year, so I can't wait for the new songs when they come out. <laughs> But it depends on what mode I'm in. If, I, if I'm really uh, excited sometimes, I will put on um, just the instrumentals because then, you know, you call it soaking music. I know. Some of you call it soaking music, you know. Oh, I've forgotten the other one. Um, the healing rooms or soaking rooms, right? Um, so you've got, all, you've got all those variety. But if you are not in a place Oh, can you be polite, Dr. Marina? No, maybe not. If you're in a place where you're struggling with God, no matter what atmosphere you're trying to create, you're not going to respond to it because your heart is hardened. Your ear is deaf. It's just noise. But when you, uh, even when you're in that dry place, come on, somebody, just a, we'll just go, oh. No words needed. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Speak, Lord. You become like Samuel. Speak, Lord. Thy servant heareth. To everyone else, it was just a hum. But to you, it was a draw. To you, it was an innate knowing that God is speaking to you or he's drawing you. We love to sing those old songs, don't we? Draw me, draw me, Lord. The old school, draw me closer, just a closer walk with you. Uh, old school for a moment, right? I love, I love going old school to, to watch the young people go, Google. <laughs> Name that tune, Google. But when you are... Let's go, she talked about intimacy. 
intimacy, when you are aroused by the presence of God, there is something inside of you that is, has a willingness to yield. There's, a, there's a, something inside of you that says, I surrender. You haven't said the words, but your actions. You haven't said anything. Your mouth hasn't expressed anything. But your whole being comes into, what, what would we call it? Unity. It, becomes into, it comes into alignment into what God wants to do. First Kings 8, I've got a, quite a few scriptures for you. First Kings 8, verse 22 to 23. You know I love talking about David. Today I'm going to talk about Solomon. And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands towards heaven. I went this way, towards heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel... There is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath who keepest covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. I want to challenge you about being a custodian. You cannot be a custodian if you don't recognize the full sovereignty, the full um, I'm getting to, I was talking to Dr. Rennie and I said to him, I'm being challenged to study theocracy. I mean, look, is that a word? Yes, it is. Because we study, um, we study theology, which is um, the study of God, right? Theonology, the study of God. But theocracy is God says it, it is so. There's no committee to be formed to debate it. There's no... Um, uh, debate team, there's no um, negotiation committee to, ne to start negotiating, there's no politically correct committee to say, is this politically correct, will we, be, will we be seen as being biased, God said it, it is so, and when I looked at the scripture, I said, oh, this, this confirms, beginning to confirm my study, I haven't come to the completion of it yet, because I'm still working through stuff, because I'm just like, Lord, you, you said your yay is yay, your, your nay is nay, but I, I need to be like Moses, I need to be like Abraham, if, by, which is why I said, per chance, <laughs> help me out, God, just per chance, there, there'll be 50, you know, do something on behalf of the 50. No, nope. per chance. No, negotiate. If you sit with Dr. Rennie at a mealtime, you'll know what negotiation looks like. Because uh, I'm trying to give him vegetables and he's trying to get carbs. But when you know that God, there is none like you. There's no God like you in heaven, above, or earth beneath. No matter what my reality is, my reality of heaven is good today. My reality of earth is challenged in this moment. But no matter what's going on, you are still God. And because I know you are God, even when I don't feel it, I am still a custodian who knows your presence. And I still can be a channel for your presence. Don't you find it strange sometimes that when backsliders are giving you a word from the Lord? You know they've got no relationship with God, but suddenly God speaks through them to you because all you need is a conduit. They're not even willing, but you have a need and God has to get something to you. So he will use your enemy. I talked about that, yeah. You can't talk about God and not acknowledge he's a covenant-keeping God. I remember in the political debates when, you know, um, they talked about health care and health care couldn't be for everybody. And now the vaccination is free and for everybody. I would just think on that for a while. Yang ran, ran on, the, on the ticket that um, every, every citizen um, should get $1,000. And, and uh, Passover last year, they were beginning to send out the stimulus checks. My children were like, at feast time, glory to God. <laughs> Why? Because he's a covenant-keeping God. 
Those of you that walked through some hard places last year and you didn't know your job closed March and you're thinking it will open back by June and by September, six months later, uh, you're still not in, a, in your job yet. You're still not, but money was still coming in. And for those of you that, that know this, um, you were receiving money funds supernaturally. You know, you were just like, God. And I, as I love to quote, he can prepare a table in the wilderness. He can send food in a dry wilderness. He can supply for you. If you keep reminding him who he is, you can be a conduit. When I think of a conduit and, and again a, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? A custodian. I think of somebody, no matter what you're going through, you remember God. He moves, he's at his best when it's impossible. I'm going I'm I'm to say to you one more time. He is at his best when it's impossible. When you say there is no way on earth, he likes to let you know, I don't live in earth. I live in heaven and I move earth. Hello, somebody. When you are a conduit, when you are a, what's the word I'm, I keep saying? Let me go back. Let me go back. A custodian. I'm getting uh, two C's, right? When you are a custodian, you are in the pathway to a host handle. Oh, I just got this visual. Uh, open uh, vision. The wind is blowing, but you can't measure it. You, there's air, but you can't measure it. But if you put it in a tube, it has a form. I'm going to say, I'm going to say great visual. If you put it in a tube, you can measure it. They've got instruments to measure the tube and the air that's in it. Why? It now becomes a channel that you can uh, that is, um, some physics person will help me with this, or engineer will help me. It becomes visual so that you can tangibly um, understand its movement. Energy is all around. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Energy is all around us, but it can be measured as kinetic energy. There is a way to measure it. And in measuring it, you know how to use it. Oh, come on. God says... I've given every one of you a measure of faith. But when you put us all together, we become an unmeasurable number of faith. I can build a cloud all by myself, but it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. I know you're enjoying this online, but it's so good to be in the house of the Lord because our cloud is tangible together. We can feel the, the presence moving. Yeah, you feel it there, but it's tangible, real tangible that I can reach out and touch somebody else. Might have to sanitize afterwards, but you know. <laughs> the new norm. I read you first Kings, Second Chronicles 9 verse 23. Talking about custodian and all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom that God had put in his heart. Psalm 17, verse 15, As for me, David says, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wake with thy likeness. Oh my goodness. Can I just, can I just press pause and, and, just, and just say this about David? You know him. You know his sins, you know his failures, you know his weaknesses, you know his triumphs. But David, how can I put this politely? Because we are 21st century people. There's no degree of sin. Sin is sin. There's no acceptable sin before God. Sin is sin. 
There's no, even if it's hidden in your heart, sin. David talked about iniquity because iniquity is inside that you can't see. It's still sin. And no matter how sinful he was, he didn't run from the presence. He ran to the presence. Even when the prophet came and gave him the illustration of stealing um, Uriah's wife, and he got all righteous and said, oh, man, they took the man's best sheep. Oh, man, you should be killed. You should be made public. You should be made public. Thou art the man. He didn't say, oh, I am king and God speaks to me. He rent his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and sought the mercy of God. I think some of you leaders have forgotten this scripture about David. David said, I'd rather fall into the hands of an angry God than angry people. Leaders, we'd rather fall into the hands of angry people because somehow we'll ask for repentance and they will be repentative towards us, but we haven't gone and fallen on our face and on our knees and cried out to an angry God who is able to turn the table of our hardened heart and make us receive the fullness of His glory again. David knew he was a conduit he knew he was a custodian and no matter what temptation he faced he knew he had one choice get into the presence of the Lord his God he would cry out hear me oh God turn not your face away from me He may have known or maybe he didn't know, but I'm going to choose to say he did know because the more you spend time in God's presence is the more identity change you have. Maybe he did know that he was made in the likeness and the image of God, no matter how many times he sinned because sin will happen as a man. Job said man is born to trouble. We're born to it. It's, it ain't. You don't have to teach a child mischief. They just do it. <laughs> you got to teach them to be good by the consequences of being bad. Hello. But David, maybe he knew. Oh, because he said in Psalms 8, one of my favorite descriptions, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Maybe he knew that he was made in the image and after the likeness of God. Because as he worshipped, the more he worshipped is the more transformed he became. That even God said, no man has got a heart after me like David. Maybe sin is what kept driving him to know more of God. Really, Dr. Marina, maybe sin because Jesus came along and said afterwards, or maybe it was David, of those that sin much, loveth much. (laughs) Custodian of his presence. When you fall into the hands of angry people, they have a remembrance that's longer than an elephant. And they will sing the song, I'll remind you, I'll remind you, I'll remind you. But when you fall into the hands of an angry God, he says, I blot out your transgressions. As deep as the ocean is, and we've now got things that can measure the depth of an ocean, and no matter how many furlongs down they go, your sin is buried even deeper than that. Get a visual this morning. The enemy has tried his hardest. He has put us um, in seclusion. We call it social distancing. He's put us in a hiding place. We call it shelter in place. But no matter what he has done, some people have sat there in depression and some have said, hear me, oh God. 
Some have said, sanctify me, separate me, transform my mind, renew my mind. Some people have come and and become a living sacrifice. Oh, purify me. I love teaching. I don't get to teach much on Leviticus and the various offerings. I love teaching on Leviticus and the offerings. I'm a blood woman. Yes, fillet the meat. Hallelujah. Get a nice sharp knife. Slice that chicken open. I be- I become a- I- sometimes I say to you, I'm a priest in motion. I cut off the fat because the fat is unto the Lord. Those of you that don't know Leviticus. Then you get a whole chicken and you've got to pull out the, the, uh, the, in, the, was it the, the entrails, uh, the, 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 the kidneys and all the things that comes in. Yes, the entrails. Yes, the liver. You've got to pull that all out. I become a priest. Hallelujah. I I pull off the skin and inspect it. You said, that's a long time, Dr. Mina. I'm a priest. I'm not cooking for children now. I have time. With children, you've got to cook within 15 minutes, right? Or it's McDonald's, right? (laughs) I got time to marinate the meat, make it a sweet smelling savor unto the Lord. Those of you that don't like cooking, hello. Maybe David knew that the more he spent with God, he became a living sacrifice. The things that were internal, that he had hidden, he had to pull it out and lay it on the altar so that God could heal it and remove it. Some of you, you're holding on to things just because no one can see it doesn't mean it's not there. My makeup is flawless. My clothing is on point. But you've got pain. You're in oppression. You're in a deep depression. But your face looks good, but your heart is broken. And when you, some people are crying out to know his presence. His presence will be a, what's the, what's the new thing? Um, that, that x-ray machine, come on. Intraviolet light. Scan, thank you. When you get in the presence, God was scanning you before science knew what it was doing. Because the Holy Spirit separates bone from marrow, tissues from nerves. He understands your deepest wound that you have buried in the depth of your soul. David called it his bowels of compassion. The things that you've hidden as hurt in the bowels of your compassion. And God, when you get in his presence, he will slice you open. Do an operation with no blood loss. Shantaramaha. With no scars. Nobody knows what he's removed. But all they know is when they see you in worship, they go, oh, she's different. Woo, shamamuruvuri yenehe. Ooh, there's a real presence about her. Oh my gosh, look at him worship. I didn't know that he had expression before. Because most of our men are. We're in his presence. Hallelujah. But they watch like a flower opening up. A visual that the Lord just dropped to me. They've gone through the storm like the palm tree. And they've been bent over. And one blow of the Holy Ghost. They erect back up and spread out their palms. And you have to know that something broke the bend to keep them bound to earth's atmosphere. And something came along that they responded to and lifted them back up to the fullness of his presence. They become a custodian of his presence again. Don't tell me you're too dead for God to use. Don't tell me you're too dried up in sin for God to use. 
Didn't he take Ezekiel and bring him to a valley of dry bones? Because God loves to show you what's impossible. You think it's impossible. God loves to show you in your dream what's impossible. And then he asks you the question, can these bones live? Doesn't mean I'm too dried up. I'm too dead. Can these bones live? Because even the dead bones still had purpose. I'm going to say it again. Even the dead bones still had purpose. Anyone looking at them over? Just dead bones. But to God, purpose just needs one breath. Shantoromaha. Purpose just needs one breath. And that one breath will draw limb to limb. Come on, get a visual with me. Limb to limb. Because even your ankles, your toes know it needs to be joined to the ankle. The ankle bone's connected to the knee bone and the knee bone's connected. Oh, I behave. Hear the word. I'm oh, sorry. By itself, it is nothing. But when it gets joined, doesn't the Bible say about the church that every member fitly joined together, fully functioning as the body? The eye cannot say of itself, I don't need the hand. The hand cannot say of itself, I don't need the foot. But everything fitly joined together. Hear me, we are not a custodian if we're just by ourselves. Me, myself, and I, we do good together. No, you're a custodian when people can connect to you. A fruit is just a fruit hanging on a tree until you pluck it and eat it. I could digress, but I won't. I'll stay, on, I'll stay on point. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 22. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will you not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual degree? I got such a visual of this. That it cannot pass it, and though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. God sets boundaries. But it's a, I love this word, perpetual decree. I'm going to use for another better meaning. It's eternal. It is everlasting. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 29 that no flesh should glory in his presence. It's a perpetual decree. I'm tying the two together. God gives man, ah, oh, I don't want to say restrictions because we've got free moral will. But when it comes to his presence, I cannot glory and say, I know his presence so well that I can bring it. Because the moment I do, I've disqualified myself. No man shall glory in his presence. No flesh shall glory in his presence. No status, I'm going to put another word in, no status of man. No fivefold should glory, their flesh, their, their gifting should glory in his presence. Because his presence is all about him. When you talk about the manifested presence of God, this, the panim, you are face to face. And, oh, what's the scripture? And face to face shall we behold him. And as we behold him, we become him. Because there is an exchange. The greater takes over the lesser. I'm just like Jesus and you're mean and you're selfish and you're rebellious 
and you're argumentative. You don't bring consolation. You bring grief. You don't bring resolution. You bring division. You can't submit. You want to rule over. You want to manipulate. And then you say, I'm bringing you into the presence. What presence? The presence of yourself. We cannot in this time and season, if there is ever a time to be a conduit, to be a custodian of the presence of God, is now the beginning of trouble, the beginning of sorrow, when men's hearts are failing them. When I talk to people who have come through or overcome COVID, one of the things that they say to me is that strong spirit of fear, that gripping fear. And I ask them, and then you know, I'm a, I like to ask questions. When does the fear hit you? At night. In your silence, you are tormented by that fear, that crippling fear. Will I be able to breathe? If, you've had, if they had um, uh, pre-cases, pre-health challenges, you know, will, will, um, will I recover? Will, it, will this just sap all my um, immune, will it sap all my immune system, my ability to fight back? No flesh should glory in his presence. This is, what, this is one, my last one that I want to challenge you on. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11 to 13. You talk about presence to, to, um, to people who are, what did I say to Dr. Murray yesterday, that are theologically minded. They study God, but they don't know God. They, they, can, they can tell you the, the history, the, like, like the Sadducees and the Pharisees, we know the law. We know the letter of the law. We know the understanding of, we know the working of, but do you know God? The cinnamon can quote to you, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restoreth my soul. The person that knows the shepherd can pause and say, let me tell you when I was troubled and he led me. Let me tell you when I was tormented and he caused me to be still, that it felt like green pastures. Let me tell you when I couldn't think and he let me just sit down and then he, I felt like oil being poured on my head. Some people can read it, but those have ex- that have experienced it can press a pause button when you're talking and say, let me tell you when. Let me give you my testimony of. 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 11 to 13, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing, I love this, spiritual things with spiritual things. If there's ever a day that we need to compare natural things and turn it and give it a spiritual solution, Did you hear the word I use? Solution. You can sit down and debate with scientists from morning till night. And they will twist and turn you all over because they're talking science. But how do you bring it spiritual? Sickness is a spirit. Disease is a spirit. Infirmity is a spirit. And I'm going to surprise you. Sin is a The natural man won't understand the things of God because they are 
foolishness to him. He cannot discern. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit that is a teacher of all things and a revealer of all things. He hello. There are Christians that don't have the Holy Spirit, so they are still sticking to, to doctrine. And doctrine is good because it's our foundation. Don't get me wrong. But when the Spirit of the Lord comes and starts revealing and searching out, and then you become the solution to things, stand to your feet. I'm going to tell you what I told all three of my children as they were going off to college. Every, all three, when I prayed over them going off to university, I didn't like the prayer, but I felt so good about it. I said to them, may you come upon new problems so that you become the solution. May you come upon, may you face new challenges that you become the solution. Because your world, your generation is looking not for debate, but for solution. What's the, what's the thing that Paul said? I do not come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, but I come to you in the demonstration. Because what? That was his gospel. We're so busy being political. We're so busy trying not to offend. I love uh, the illustration that Petrina gave. We are a... We're supposed to be this big P projecting his, 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 um, his presence. And we're, we're, sometimes we're just so small. We're, we feel so insignificant. But I want to remind you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I'm going to go back to David. Could it be that David, going so much in God's presence, even though he cried out, hear me, O God. But he knew, David talked more about God Almighty than any other in the Old Testament. He knew him, his revelation, even as a man struggling with sin, struggling with weakness. He knew God, his revelation of God was God Almighty. I challenge you. Be a custodian of his presence. Know the fullness of who he is. Absorb his greatness. Absorb his gratitude. Absorb his mercy that endureth forever and ever. I don't know what you are walking through, somebody that's watching online. I don't know when you felt like you had given up or you gave up, but I thank you for staying on and hearing this word and the words over this weekend. That as dead as you feel, just one breath can make your bones come to life. And that one breath can rejuvenate purpose and the seeds of purpose that's inside of you. Just that one breath. And then look at you telling people about how good and how great God is. Lift your hands up in this presence. We thank you, Jesus. We want you to message us on our Facebook pages or you can leave a comment down below of how God is moving in your life or how you just accepted Jesus. We would love to hear from you and get back with you on the awesome decision that you just made, the awesome decision in your life that you just made. Hey, before we go, make sure that you like and subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so that you know the next time we upload. Remember, we are maximizing your life with the Word of God. We love you. We'll see you next time.